For our meditation shall we turn to the Gospel according to Saint Luke. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. Shall we read the first four verses? And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of, out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. We see here Jesus doing something, Jesus saying something, and what we must understand about Jesus is that he is not like us. Everything that he did and everything that he said were full of meaning and full of purpose. Here we see that there's a large gathering of people waiting to hear the word of God. It's like a Sunday service, like all of you sitting and waiting to hear the word of God. There's a huge crowd of people waiting to hear the word of God. And uh, as they were waiting, Jesus did something. First of all, the waters were bobbing gently there, and, and there were two ships on them, bobbing along the waters. Jesus looked at the two ships. The fishermen were not in the ships, they were washing their nets. Jesus purposefully, deliberately entered into one ship. He, what we would do is we would just, if you want to walk out of this place, we may use one door or the other. But Jesus did everything with a purpose. You know the story and the miracle that took place later. Had Jesus entered the other ship, that miracle wouldn't have taken place. Jesus deliberately entered into Simon's ship. And then, while all the people were waiting for the message, Jesus spoke to Simon and asked him, can you move that ship a little a little outside. Can you move your ship a little outside? Probably Simon would have thought it is for improved acoustics or for a better view of the people. But Jesus did that with a purpose. And Jesus after that he taught the people. Then he turned back to Simon and again spoke to him. And we see Jesus told him, launch out into the deep. Praise the Lord. We see here, Jesus turned Peter's boat into a pulpit. And Jesus gave two sermons that day. Not one, but two. Jesus gave two messages that day. That is what I want you to observe. The first message was for the common people, for everybody there. A common message for all. But... That was only the first message. There was another message which was not for everyone. It was a message for Peter alone. It was a personal message. And there is no indication that anyone else heard those words. I imagine Jesus would have whispered to him with the background of all the sea noises. His words would not have reached the other people. I don't know what the message he preached that day to all the people were. I'm not saying it is not important, but my Bible does not record it. But my Bible has recorded the personal message that he gave Peter. Let's for a moment understand. There is a common message for all, and we all hear it and it is recorded as well. But the personal message that God gives you at that time is more important than the common message heard by everyone. When people hear the common message, they will note down all the details of the message, they know the facts, the names, the years, and you know they will be able to answer any question. If there's a quiz, they will get full. But 
Do you get the personal message? Are you able to hear the personal message? Launch out into the deep, Peter. First of all, he said, Peter, move away from the land. Let not your ship touch the land. Move into the water, Peter. Then he said, Peter, launch out into the deep. It might have been a whisper that day. Today, I want to amplify that whisper. And I want to focus not on the main message he gave, but on the personal message he gave. When people go to the sea, they go for basically two reasons. One of the two reasons. One, they go for pleasure. And two, they go for business. People who go for pleasure, they go to the seaside. And it is in the seaside that they get all their pleasure. They have beach resorts, they have games and they have casinos and restaurants and people probably lie down in the sun and they like to watch the waves or they love to see children running around gathering crabs or shells or building sand castles. You get all that fun. It's on the beach. It's on the seaside. And people often visit for fun. Now, that's one purpose for which people go there. But then, you may see another group, a small group, fishermen. They walk past these pleasures. They walk past these people. They don't even turn and look or stop and laugh. They are there for business. And they do something which these people won't do. They go past the shallow water and they enter into deep water. We see that Jesus very often in scripture taught through nature. He taught through trees. He taught through birds. He taught through the weather and nature's fury. He taught through plants, through seeds and so on. And even in this incident, Jesus is teaching us something. He's showing us that there are two kinds of lives, two kinds of people in the church. They are in our church also. They are shallow people and deep people. There are two kinds of Christians, shallow Christians and deep Christians. Shallow Christians... They come to the seaside, they come for meetings, and in general, their lives are very shallow. They may have plenty of activities on the seaside. They may be very busy on the seaside. There's plenty of running, plenty of noise, yes, plenty of ministries and so on. But they do not go past shallow water. They remain in shallow waters because their whole life and purpose is all there. They are shallow Christians. There is no depth in their life. It's easy to find a shallow Christian. Maybe you have to look into the mirror. Are you a shallow Christian or are you a deep Christian? There are some others, when they come to the seaside, they do not come for fun. When they come to church, they don't come for fun. I don't know why you came today. Did you come because there's going to be a quiz? Or there's going to be something in between the meeting and the quiz? Some people are eagerly waiting for such things. But... There are some who go past these things. These things are not so material to them. They want something else. They are looking for something else. They are on a business. Even when they come to the presence of God on a Sunday, they are on a business. It's not a holiday. They are working. They are working. They have come to invest. They have come to receive. They have come on business. So, I am going to now show you the difference between a shallow and a deep Christian. Well, shallow Christians is quite easy, we know. There won't be any depth in maybe if they talk or they testify or 
you know, there is no deep desire for God in them. There is no depth in their life. It's all very shallow. Everything is shallow. But a deep Christian, like the fisherman, he will go past the shallow waters. He will go where the water is deep. But you know, where the water is deep, it means the water is dangerous also. But that will not keep them away. They go where it is dangerous because they are deep Christians. So let us try and understand some few things about these deep Christians. Let's remember going back to what Jesus told Peter. What did Jesus tell Peter? Peter, your boat is still touching the ground. Can you push your boat away? Away from this earth. Away from this ground. He was speaking right there about the importance of separation. Go out Peter. Go, 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 go. And then he said, Peter, please launch out into the deep. Cast your net in deep waters. Now, who was Peter? Peter was not a nurse, a doctor, a computer technician. Peter was a professional fisherman. He knew his job. And here was a professional fisherman getting the most unprofessional advice from the son of a carpenter. What does Jesus know about fishing? What does Jesus even know about Lake Gennesaret? He told Peter, Peter, throw your net into the deep water. And Peter must have looked at Jesus. Probably Jesus didn't know. The deepest part of Lake Gennesaret is only 141 feet. And Jesus told him, Cast it into the deep waters. If I were in Peter's place, my first thing would be, I have to cover up the mistake of Jesus. Jesus has messed up. He made a mistake. So what I would do, is I would quietly walk up to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know, it's a very shallow lake and people heard you. So before they start talking, can you quickly kind of, you know, just change your words a bit. But when I look at what Peter did, it amazes me. A professional fisherman who knew the waters, not only had he known the waters, he knew the behavior of the fish. And not just that, he had a terrible experience for the past probably 15 hours. Read verse 5. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Never we have toiled all night. The man of the sea is now speaking of his experience. Jesus, these are the facts. We have worked all night. We have worked all night and we got nothing. This is the fact. Peter doesn't ignore facts sometimes, you know, when God tells you, you are healed. We believe it. And we deny facts. Like for example, if there's pain, we say, no, there's no pain, there's no pain. That's positive thinking. No. The fact is a fact. Yes, there is pain. There is pain. I, I know that I am feeling things. But, carry on. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. What we understand about Peter here is this. Peter, first of all, he was an uneducated man. You know, if Peter was in our congregation, probably you wouldn't like him too much. You wouldn't sit near him. First of all, yuck, he smells. He smelt a fish all through the day. So you wouldn't be within a few feet of him. He would sit by himself. Secondly, Peter wasn't cultured. He wasn't dignified. He wouldn't be wearing a tie. Probably he would be wearing some loin cloth or something. And no one would have taught him, you know, decent behavior here in a church meeting. He would have been blowing his nose or digging his nose or, you know, he must have been making all kinds of noises. And people wouldn't have told him, Peter, Peter, you know, you're not supposed to do this in public. 
He said, but I do it in my house, my wife doesn't say anything. Now that's Peter, rustic, uncivilized, uncultured, uh, fisherman in every sense of the word. But look at something amazing he has that we don't. He knew the waters, he knew the behavior of the fish, and he knew that that day there was no catch. He said, God, the fact is, I have worked. We toiled all night, we got nothing. But, because you have said so, I am going to let down my net. In verse 6, what happens? And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. What do we understand from this little, little incident? I don't know whether the creator, he was the creator standing there, Jesus is the creator. I don't know whether he created fish and put them there. Maybe, may not be, I don't know. I don't know whether the fishes were really, Jesus had earlier commanded the fishes to go and sit in a corner there and wait till I command you. And then when he spoke, all the fish came and waited there for Peter's net. I don't know. What I know is this, and I will tell you what I know. That this was called a miracle of obedience. It was the obedience of Peter that brought this miracle. Sometimes Jesus tells us to do things that are unnatural, unreasonable. Do you know another miracle of obedience that took place in the Gospels? The very first miracle of Jesus, water turned into wine was a miracle of obedience. Jesus told them, do this. And the people thought, um, does he know what he's talking? Then Mary said, just do as he tells you. Just do it. And they did it, and it, it became a miracle. Peter was not educated. In, in one sense, it's good, because educated people, they've got big heads. And the heads that think too much, and we think more than we should think. But Peter was, you know, he had no brains, praise God, but a large heart. And he just believed and he obeyed. So we understand something here. Deep Christians are obedient Christians. I wouldn't say they are scholars. I wouldn't say they may have an extensive Bible knowledge. No. You can be a scribe, you can know a lot in the Bible. You may be able to memorize a large portion of the Bible. But deep Christians are not those with a large memory capacity. They are those whose character reveals depth. I'm happy that parents encourage the children to learn large passages in the Bible. It will really help them in the future. But that alone is not enough. There must be character. Children must learn how to obey, how to grow, how to love Jesus. And as parents, we need to give an example for them to follow. So first of all, deep Christians are obedient. And it's not just you know, doing things that are easy. Sometimes Jesus tells you, do this, and it, it makes no sense. But you do it because Jesus told you. Next, what happens? When they launch out into the deep, of course they have to go past the seaside, they go past the fun, they go past the activity, even, even say, just let me give a little analogy as an example. I'm not really meaning this, but just to make you understand. Say, a meeting is over. And I say, this place has to be made ready. You will find there are certain believers, their mind is focused on doing the job, on doing the ministry. So they just get about doing, they don't think, okay, let me go and meet the people, let me go and say hi. No, they just get about their business. The same time, you will always find a one group, they can't stop talking. When a meeting is over, they see this person probably for the billionth time, and what has changed? Probably one black hair has turned gray, or maybe the other way as well. But, apart from that, there is no change. And yet you want to see him, you want to say hi. Why? Because 
That's got into our system. We like activity. We want fun. By the way, I'm not talking about new souls. I told you about new souls. When you see a new soul, you better go and speak to them. Welcome them. Make them happy. That's your job. But I'm talking of the people you've seen. You saw them Friday night. You saw them Saturday morning. You saw them Saturday night before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting. You saw them before this meeting. You saw them during the meeting. And when you see them after the meeting, Hi, I haven't seen you for 15 years. You can see that I'm bringing this analogy in. Okay, forget the example. What I'm saying is there are two kinds of believers. One, there are believers who are just interested in, you know, talking and fun and activity. But there is another kind of believer. They are deep believers. They just go past activity. Go past. They go past the seaside life. They go past the restaurants. They go past everything. Because their minds are set on something else. They, they have come on business. They want something from God. They are seeking God for something. So they go past into deep waters. And what happens there? What happens in deep waters? If you turn now to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 verse 23 and verse 24. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. Hmm. How beautiful is that verse. They are going past the shallow waters and they are going into deep waters. Why? They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. They are here on business. Even when they come for a meeting, they are here on business. Because they are here on business, they are here to speak to God. They are here to hear the voice of God. So what do they do? They prayerfully come. They seek the face of God and come. They fast and come. You know, some believers can't even fast on a Sunday morning. They come belly full. They're burping through the meeting. What do you expect to get? You expect the Lord to fill you? You're already full. But some, they are seeking God. God, please speak to me. How many believers prayed this morning? Don't put up your hand. How many of you prayed and said, God, you speak to me. Lord, speak to my heart. How many of you just walked out of your house and just walked in here and, you know, that's it. You never even bothered to think, this is the presence of God you never wanted. You, you can see your own life. This word of God is a mirror and it will just show you who you are. But the serious ones, the, those who are doing business, they come in ships and they go past the shallow waters, they go into deep waters. And what do they see there? They see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. It is in deep waters that you can see the wonders of God. You may see the wonders of the word of God because you're able to understand it in a deeper way. The word of God, it just opens up, unravels and you begin to see the depth, the mysteries. Because God is speaking to you. It's not just man. God is revealing things to you. And you just start marveling. Have you seen in a meeting two kinds of people? One person, he opens his book. The other opens his mouth. The person opens his book, he's, he's writing down, writing down, he's collecting treasures, he's noting it down because he wants the word. Some may not write, but they may listen intently. Some don't even listen. It's so interesting because I find this every church I've been to. There are believers who listen, there are believers who don't listen. And you just can't change people because that's all to do with their character. My mom used to tell me when I was in India, in those early days, probably 1980s, in the beginning of 80s or maybe late 70s, if there was a convention and the chief pastor would get up on that Sunday morning, he would, he would get up to deliver the message and immediately a hush would descend on the congregation. And they would say, Oh, Simon, message, we're going to hear the word of God. There was an excitement and there was a pin drop silence as they waited. Today, I have seen how it is. The pastor will be preaching there and you'll see her families having picnics. Banana skins lying here, children playing there, people sleeping there, 
And believe it or not, you see people even changing their clothes in some corner. I don't know why they came there, for a picnic or what. It just reminds me of the seaside. Get popcorn. And people are like crabs. You get everything. You want entertainment? Go there. But, but it's not all like that. There is one group who are serious. They are longing for the word of God. Now when you are like that, obviously you will start seeing the wonders in the deep. You will feel the presence of God. You will hear the voice of God. You will experience the power of God. And you, through this meeting, you will enjoy some marvelous experience of the Spirit of God. To another person, well, it was just like any other meeting, nothing so spectacular. What is spectacular for them? Probably this roof leaks or some water, a tsunami comes in. That is spectacular. Dear believer, I am talking of wonders. Wonders that others don't see. Wonders that you can see. Wonders that you can experience. Deep Christians are obedient Christians. And because they obey and go past the shallow waters, they begin to see wonders. But there is more there. What happens in those deep waters? You, that is where you may find sharks. That is where you may find piranhas. And that is where you find waves, dangerous waves, high waves. But knowing that, they still go there because that's where they find the depths. You read now verse 25 to verse 30. Psalm 107 from 25 to 30. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. Oh, the waves are now rising. Yes, tidal waves. Listen to the description, how graphically they are described. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro, and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired heaven. Here we see that those who have gone into the deep waters, it's not easy, it's not easy out there, it's not a picnic there, no games there, no fun, no activities there. It's fraught with danger. The waves rise up so high, the Bible says there is as if the waves are mounting up to heaven. And what happens? Their boat has to ride the waves, so the boat goes up. And the next minute the boat goes right down to the depths, rising up and down. It's not an easy thing to be there. And you see very clearly there, these Christians experience very deep trouble. And their soul melts, their body staggers, and their mind is affected. All their soul, their body and spirit, all three parts. Soul melts, body staggers and they come to their wits end. In the margin, coming to the wits end means their wisdom is swallowed up. That means there's no more solution. Until then, you, well, you can try this, maybe you can try that. There are so many things to try, but at one point you, your wisdom is swallowed up. You don't know what else to do. Your soul is melted, your body is staggering like a man who is drunk, and your wisdom is swallowed up. You come to an end. That is the kind of life deep Christians lead. The trials that they face are deep trials too. Deep is their obedience, deep are the wonders they see, but deep are the trials they face also. Terrible trials that they face. But by the way, let's just quickly come back for a quick look at shallow Christians. Where are they? They are on the shore. Shallow Christians, they are on the shore. There is no depth there. But you find they question God for the slightest trial, smallest difficulty they can't bear. Everything is too much for them. They can't bear even little puddles, little streams. Have you seen children on the seashore? They'll be there. 
And this little tiny wave with these little tiny ripples will come gingerly up to their feet to lap their toes. And there's, ah! they scream like they're dying. Oh, the water! Oh, and when they go home, mommy, you don't know what happened. This water came, it came up to my neck. Are they lying? No, that's what they are like. Shallow Christians are like that. It's only a little stream, but for them it's up to their neck. They can't bear. Because shallow Christians are like that. When you can't bear a little thing that comes up to your feet, how are you going to bear it when the waters rise up to the heavens? You read, please read Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 5. Jeremiah 12 5. If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee. If you have run with footmen, that means now you are running with people who are also running. And you are tired. When you are running with people you are tired. Then how canst thou contend with horses? How can you run with horses? If you can't even run with people, how are you going to contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest, uh. they weary thee. See, when in, a, in a land where everything is peaceful, you, you got a good family, you got a good husband, you got a good home, you got money, you got food, everything you have. One little trial comes, that's it. I want to die. I can't bear this. If in a land of peace, you have become weary. Then how will thou do in the swelling of Jordan? What will happen when you are taken from that comfortable land to the swelling of Jordan? Meaning, you have entered into the deep trial that others are facing. What are you going to do? Pastor Wesley used to tell us the story of the man. He went to, he, he was fed up, he wanted to commit suicide. So he went up to the river's brink to jump into the water. I want to die. I want to meet my watery grave. He's about to jump into the water, to die by water. Just then it started raining and he ran for cover. He wants to die by water. Now even drops are terrifying him. If little streams, little puddles little waters just lapping at your feet they are terrifying you what are you going to do when things escalate when things become bad what is it showing you is it showing you how the, the difference in the height of the water no it is showing you how shallow you are even this I can't bear even that I can't bear Small thing I can't bear. Then what happens when it becomes intense? Think about it. I want to think about it for my own life. When I think of what other servants of God or other believers go through, I feel I'm going through nothing. I have been through nothing. And if my nothing is a big thing, then what happens when I go through something? Let us not be shallow Christians staying on the shore and questioning God for the slightest difficulty. Those who are deep Christians will go past all these. Nextly, deep Christians have deep foundations. If you turn to Luke's Gospel chapter 6 and read verse 48. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Okay. Here we see another beautiful facet, a beautiful character trait of a deep Christian. So far we have seen a deep Christian, he's an obedient Christian, and he goes past shallow waters, he goes into deep waters. When he comes for a meeting, he may see others around him. They'll be talking, they'll be whispering, they'll be distracted. Some people cannot pray. They cannot focus on God. They're all the time looking here, looking there, and keep themselves busy. We have a brother in the UK. I won't mention his name, so you'll never guess who he is. But he's a brother I know, because I, I worked in his assembly. 
He, I know that he cannot close his eyes. He just can't close his eyes. In a prayer meeting, he can't talk to God. He has no relationship with God. So what does he do? At the same time, he's an old believer. So he still wants to feel he's an old believer, meaning a deep Christian. And he knows he can't talk to God. So what he does is, when he comes to a meeting, he'll make himself busy. He'll look around for something to do. And if there's nothing to do, he'll create something. I've seen him. He will take his phone, he will walk around. Looks like either he's going to receive a call or make a call. Or he will hold a pen or do something. He'll be just walking, walking here, there, everywhere, making himself busy. And being a person who observes, I just watch his movements and I know, I say, I know that. But I wouldn't tell him because there's no point. But I know he can't sit down and talk to God. He has no relationship with God. So many are like that. In church, there'll be so many people, they can't sit down and focus on God. So what do they do? Their restless spirit cannot be tamed. So they, they channel it into a ministry mode. Okay, let me go around, let me do something, let me just keep, make myself busy. But they don't have a relationship with God. So they remain as shallow Christians. But deep Christians go past. They go past it. Prayer time, they don't care what's happening. They just focus on God. If they are told to do something, they immediately obey. You now some, some Christians, they want to pray. And if they're told, can you do this? Oh no, I'm praying. So you see, there's no obedience. But they have obedience too. They, when they pray, they really pray. When they obey, they truly obey. They go past shallow waters into deep waters. In deep waters, they see deep wonders. They face deep trials. But if you remember the psalm that you read, I made you go past it. Do you remember the first two words that you read in that psalm? You heard about the waves that mount up to the sky. You heard about everything that happens, the soul melting, the staggering and all that. What were the first two words? For he commanded ah, and raised the see, stormy wind. See, that is their assurance. They know these trials are taking place, but why? Because my Jesus allowed it to happen. He commanded. He commanded. Can you see that? These deep Christians, in all their trials, they go, they go past the waters, they go past the waves, and they say, my God commanded. We know Joseph. He went through it. Terrible trial, family problem, people turning against him. But he said, it's not them. He commanded. He commanded. And they can see the hand of God behind the waves, behind the wind. If you did not read those three words, you will only read about the waves and that's how many are facing their trials. It's all waves and water and problem and burden and sorrow. Where is God? Those words are gone. Even God has been washed away in that wave. But a deep Christian will hold on to the fact, my God commanded it. My God has permitted it. Not the people. Not the people. My life is not in the hands of people. I am not cast upon the mercies of people. My life is designed by God. My path is planned by God. And therefore, though I may shed tears, I will not doubt my God. How strong is their faith? How firm is their assurance? How sure is their confession? So even when their soul melts and their body staggers and their wisdom is swallowed up, yet they continue to trust in their God. Now, look at the next beautiful quality about them in Luke. We see here, deep Christians have deep foundations. What does the wise man do in this passage? We see, he first of all digged deep or dug deep and laid a foundation upon a rock. What do we understand from this? When the wise man, you know, he digs, he keeps on digging and digging and digging and digging until he finds a rock. And then he uses that rock as his foundation. That is what we read here. He didn't just dig. He dug deep. He dug deep, meaning he had to dig a long time until he found a rock. Then he laid his foundation. Shallow Christians, what do they do? They just build anywhere. 
they don't give importance to their foundation. They don't give any importance to depth. You see in a prayer meeting, say for example, if the Spirit of God is urging us to repentance, deep Christians will go deep into that. Shallow Christians will say, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, forgive Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen. Can we have the next point, please? There is no depth in their prayer, there is no depth in their repentance, there is no depth in anything. They are just shallow. In, the, in a prayer meeting they are shallow. Everything is shallow. And a weekend passes and they have only experienced something shallow. But do you know what a deep Christian in this church will do? When they come for a meeting they start digging. Why? They are digging and digging their own heart. They are digging and digging and digging. They are looking for a rock. They are looking for a firm rock, a ground to build upon. And until they find a rock, they will keep digging. You know why? They are not satisfied with earth. Earth is not enough. Soft soil is not enough. I am looking for a rock. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11, that Jesus is our rock, our foundation. There is no other foundation. Which means, in every meeting, what are they looking for? They're looking for Jesus. In every message, what are they looking for? They're looking for Jesus. In a prayer meeting, they're digging and digging and digging and digging. Why? They're waiting to find Jesus. Because apart from Christ, there is nothing in this meeting. In a time of worship, shallow Christians will say, Wow, I like the music. Oh, I like this tune. It's so cool. And they are all stirred up emotionally. When the tune is nice, they are also emotionally stirred up. <laughs> and in a little dream I had this morning, I saw a group of people worshipping. They were singing a song and I was singing it after. And then after a while I thought, what is this song? The words were so shallow, but they were dancing. They were dancing and singing, but there was no depth in the song. And I was thinking, what kind of shallow? I never knew that this was my message. Only now as I am preaching, I am remembering it. You see, but the deep Christians, even when the words are put up on the screen, they are digging. They are going deeper, deeper. Where, where is the rock? Where is Christ? I want to find Him. I want to find Him. They are looking for Jesus in every part of the meeting. The Jews, in the Bible we read of the Jews at Berea. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 17, we read of the Jews at Berea. They were so different from the other believers. What do we read about them? Acts 17 and verse 10 and verse 11. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. See, first of all they received the word readily, then? And search the scriptures daily mm. whether those things were so. Okay. You hear a message on Sunday. What do you do for the rest of the week? How many believers actually go home and read the word of God? Or go back on what sermon was preached on Sunday? How many of you go back? Wednesday Bible study? I know you do it because you want points. Apart from that, do you look for Christ? Do you go back and dig? You go back and dig. You know the Bible speaks about the cow and there's a spiritual revelation from that. It, the Bible mentioned it chews the cud. Do you know what a cow does? It first eats the food. It just gathers everything. Then it goes to a corner, sits down, regurgitates it and then begins to slowly chew it and chew it and chew it. It speaks of a life of meditation. I grew up in a home where that was practiced. Something was preached on Sunday. But in the prayer meetings at home, those points were brought out. Points were mentioned. It was meditated on. Throughout the week, we were hearing what was preached on Sunday. How many parents are doing this for your children? I was so privileged to have parents like this. You know you can do it, but some parents just won't bother. Well, they're spiritual. Someone said they're spiritual. But throughout the week, they have their own messages to give their children. Sunday's message is never mentioned. Why? 
because they are not like the Jews at Berea. But look at the Jews here. They receive the word in readiness. That's like a cow eating fully. Then daily they were searching the scriptures to see if it was so. That speaks of a life of meditation. So these are deep Christians. They are digging deep to find the rock. Let's go back to Luke's gospel chapter 6 and read verse 48. Such deep Christians who keep digging and digging and digging until they find a rock, what happens? Something precious happens to them. Because their foundation is upon a rock, when the stream beats upon it and the flood rises against it and the wind blows against it, what happens? They are strong. Why? The last few words tells us, For it was founded upon a rock. Dear believer, please understand one thing. Why do you shake in your trial? Why do you so easily get upset? Why do you so easily shake and stagger and lose your hope and come to your wit's end? You may have a severe trial, but why is your confidence in God shaking? Because you are not founded upon God. Your foundation is not upon a rock. Probably your foundation is upon people. When you build your foundation on people, sometimes we build our foundation on servants of God. And we are hoping and trusting in people. One thing I'll tell you, man changes, but God never changes. Our confidence, our foundation must not be in man whose breath is in his nostrils. Our rock is Christ. He is the unchanging one. And our foundation must be on him. If we are building our lives upon Jesus, when these trials come, even if we are in pain and agony and sorrow, there will be a firmness in our stand. We will still be able to praise our God. We will still be able to trust our God. Our faith will not shake. We may struggle. We may have sort of natural reactions. But the foundation makes us safe. Three kinds of things come against this wise man's house. Rains from above. Floods from below. And winds from the side. They speak of three kinds of trials. Floods, well, rains from above speaks of the trials that come directly from God. Yes, God also directly permits trials in our lives. Rains from above. Secondly, floods from below. They speak of the temptations or the persecution that people come against us with. They are temptations from people. As long as you're living with people, as long as you're living in a world of people, you can expect these kind of floods. Thirdly, there are winds. What do winds speak of? We know winds from the book of Daniel. They speak of evil powers, evil forces. Yes, winds speak of tests from the devil. You see, we have trials that God takes us through. We have trials that people take us through. And we've got even trials that the devil will take us through. But who cares? As long as the foundation is deep and our, our foundation is built upon the rock, we will stand firm in such trials. But what if the foundation is not deep? According to Mark's Gospel chapter 4 verse 5, when the foundation is not deep, and some fell on stony ground where it had much, not much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. It had no depth. So immediately it just withered and went away. When the sun, sun means trials. So you can see how little trials. I, I, it's so nice when believers are happy. It's so nice when believers are revived. It's so nice to see believers, they love the Lord. But it's sad when you see believers, when they go through a trial, they question God. It is not wrong to cry. Some people say, don't cry, don't shed tears. No, it is natural. We will cry. There is nothing wrong in shedding tears. Has anyone ever told you don't cry? That's a nice question to ask them. If I don't shed tears now, what will the Lord wipe away when I go to heaven? We will shed tears. There is no doubt. But... Never confess a negative confession. 
questioning God. Why is God permitting this? Why is God doing this? When you start questioning God, you are actually realizing your foundation is not right. You're, you've not built it. You're, you're not dug deep enough and found the rock. So, in a weekend meeting, you may have a revival. You, you find believers, they have a, 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 a sudden spark of revival one weekend. Suddenly, they, we wonder, gosh, where was this person all along? Sudden revival, sudden, maybe a prophecy or a testimony. or Oh, God did something, God did something. And we see all this screaming and shouting and clapping and something has happened. How long does it last? Let not our lives be built upon an emotional revival. Every revival must be built upon a foundation. Must have its foundation on Christ. Let me say just a few more words before I finish. Nextly, deep Christians will have a deep knowledge of God. If you turn to Romans chapter 11 and read verse 33. Romans chapter 11 verse 33. There's such a depth in the knowledge of God. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Deep Christians know that God is a deep God. So they want to know the depths of God. They start seeking. They want to know. They want to study. They are true theologians. They want to know, study God. They're full of you know, I want to know my God. I want to know my God. I want to know Him more. I want to know Him. They're deep. But shallow Christians, they worship a shallow God. Their God is just there to provide their needs. and He's just like this man at Tesco's. That's all. They go and say, I want this, 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 this. Take it all to Him. They pay the price. He says, bye, see you next time. And that's it. That's all their relationship with God is. But deep Christians don't do that. They, they say, God, just put the grocery aside. I, I want to talk to you. I want to know who you are. I want to be acquainted with you, Lord. So deep Christians, they want to know God in a deeper way. Believer, what is your discovery of God in your personal life? You may know people. You may know, you know, so many things to counsel people. Or you, you may have wisdom about so many things. My question is, do you know God? Do you know God? Are you digging deep to find God? Are you launching out into the deep waters to know your God in a deeper way? Even though we may not be able to dig deep, the Holy Spirit has given to us because He searches the deep things of God and we see how He reveals those things to us according to 1 Corinthians 2.10. So He reveals it to us, but He will reveal it to only those who are seeking Him for these depths. Your earthly wisdom may be limited. In church often we find people, in the UK I know of a particular believer, well I know of a few believers like that anyway, who in their, in their worldly profession they can answer any question. They are able to help in the ministries because you know, they know, you know exactly how, if they are builders, you know, and you have a, now we had this little problem with the floor. All we have to do is ask them. They will tell you exactly how to deal with this floor situation. You got fungus on the wall. They'll tell you to do this, do that. They know they have answers to every problem in the world. But when it comes to God, they are so pathetically far away. They just cannot understand. They don't want to understand. There is no depth in their knowledge of God. They are not deep Christians. They're just useful, but they're not faithful. But here we see of deep Christians, they understand God. How? Where did they understand Him? They understood Him in the deep waters. They didn't stay in shallow places. Then, according to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 to 19, they are deep in the love of God. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 to 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Deep Christians, their foundation, they are rooted in the love of God and they have a relationship with the saints of God. Many believers, their relationship with the servants of God is very shallow. Sometimes very crooked also. It's not straightforward. To the face it may be straightforward. Behind the back there's so much other things going on. But here, deep Christians, it is along with the saints. 
You know, sometimes we visit homes, we visit believers. And as servants of God, now I can speak, not for myself alone, I've got two sisters with me as proof. When we visit homes, we understand the state of the family by the words they speak. Sometimes believers, when we sit down to pray, they are so honest in their confession. They just openly say, this is our state. And they just bring out all their dirt and show us. Probably they'll think, now what do the servants of God think about us? Well, this is what we think about you. We really thank God for you. We really praise God that we have found Christians who can bring out their dirt and say, this is our true state. Why do they repent like that? Why do they bring out everything like that? Because they want a change in their life. It's not very common to find it. Visit another home, there's such a difference there. They are entertainers. They may have so many interesting things to talk about, but so little of God. Very, very little. So we are also discovering believers as we travel from home to home. So I've just given you a clue. Next time we come to your house, as soon as we come in, even before we sit down and say, I want to know God. I need to know more about Jesus. Please, have you brought your Bible with you? So just say that, okay? And you can really fool us. Christians, deep Christians, in the fellowship of the saints, they learn the length, the depth, the breadth, and the height of God's love. If you remember one Bible study, I taught you this in detail. I'm not going to go into that. I will just make the statement. What is the length of God's love? It is His long suffering. That means how long He bears us. How long? He says, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. That is forbearance. So when we are learning that love, we also become like that. We start becoming Christians who can bear. We start bearing, bearing. There is a length in our love. With the saints, we learn this. Sometimes with the suffering with the saints also. Secondly, the breadth of God's love or the wideness in our love. How wide is our love? Or how much can we include people in our love? That means we are not partial in our affections. We don't just hold on to a few people, you know. How wide can you stretch out your arms to love a person? Maybe you just choose a little family circle and you love only them. That means your love has no breadth. There is no justice. So when you have wideness in your love or breadth, it means you include all. There's no partiality or you are righteous in your love. There are some believers, even in this church, praise God, there are some believers whom I can boldly say they love everybody. They don't just love, you know, that family and this family. They are not part of a group. Anybody who's part of a group, you become a headache. You become a pain. And I'm just saying this openly in case you are. See, when you love, love everybody. Don't be picky. Don't choose people to love. Love everybody. There is a wideness in God's love. The breadth of His love makes it all inclusive. That is why Romans chapter 10 verse 12 tells us that there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. It's a wideness in His love. Thirdly, there's a depth in His love. Or what is this deep? How deep is his love that means Jesus came down from heaven. Length means he went all the way. Breath means he included all the people. Now he came down from heaven. How low? He was willing to die for sinners. He went down to hell and ministered the gospel to people in Noah's time. And that shows the depth of his love. How deep can we go in order to show mercy to a person? That shows the depth of our love. St. Paul says he descended before he ascended. So also, we must be able to stoop as low. Sometimes we, we have a limit. I can't go any deeper to forgive a person. But can you go just a little deeper and forgive? Let there be depth to your love. Finally, well, that depth means mercy or compassion. And then, height of God's love. What is the height of his love that speaks of the grace of God? Meaning this. Jesus did not simply come down and show mercy and go away. What is he doing? He came down, showed mercy. Now he's taking us up with him. He is making us his bride. That's the height of his love or meaning that is what the grace of God is doing. Mercy forgave us. Grace is transforming us. Only by mercy and only by grace 
Jesus is now raising us up to heavenly places through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Would we do that to others? Yes, you went down to forgive a person. Would you bring that person up and make them live with you? Would you bring that person up and make them one with you? Depth of love. Depth of knowledge of God. Depth in everything. Deep Christians. Launch out into the deep. That was not a message the people heard. That was a message Peter heard. I preached it today to all the people. But I believe there is at least one Peter sitting here. And you heard that message in your heart. As a personal message. Others may hear it as the common message. And they may go. But you are Peter. Jesus entered into your boat. He is now telling you. Launch out into the deep. There are wonders waiting for you. There are beautiful revelations. There may be trials waiting for you. But remember. Dig deep. You will find Jesus there. Shall we stand?